Ignition sequence starts. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Hey everybody, this is the Digital Asset Investor and they are cranking up the IPO rhetoric on CNBC. This is the former Reddit CEO. I think we're all trying to understand, Ellen, you know, what, what, what this IPO means, how to think about the value of this company. Uh, and you've uh, lived inside it for, uh, for quite some time and watched it for quite some time. When you think about the valuation of Reddit today, what do you think? I think it's it's hard. Reddit has always been a strange company. It's always been hard to manage. It's been um, hard to understand its users, and it's been a very unique set of users. So they don't like advertising. They don't like um, being told what to do. And in a public company, there's a lot more regulation. There's a lot more control. There's a lot uh, more limitations, and there's a lot more information shares. So I think it's going to be a very interesting IPO. I'm curious to see where the price winds up over the next few months. And okay, so she uh, sounds like she likes uh, being a private company better, but they're headed to, for IPO, and so is Link2. Check this out. Link2 still got their tournament going uh, right now. It's Circle versus Impossible Foods, Anthropic uh, versus Expansive. There's a I got a a message that there was a 10% discount on Circle shares today. Might want to go check that out. We've got an XRP price that is sustaining right around that 69 to 70 cent level, and it's pretty exciting. I bought more XRP this morning. I bet I just made a decision about a week or two ago. I'm just going to keep on buying XRP um, until uh, as long as it's below a dollar. I'm just going to do it. So I am doing it. I bought some yesterday, the day before, I think. Maybe the day before. And I think I'm going to buy some tomorrow. And that's the fact, Jack. Now, um, let's see here. Yeah, so it's showing 69. Usually Fiat Leak is a little ahead of um, coin market cap. Then we've got this, Dusty BC, XRP breaking out of the six and a half year downtrend. Now, if you look at his chart, he's pointing target one to about uh, right around the all-time high and target two around six bucks. And we like the looks of that. Then this guy comes in, present XRP present time looks eerily similar to 2017 before it went crazy. Dumb money would deny this chart though, LOL. Um, and then he goes on down here, says once breakout, imagine all the narratives that will uh, come, LOL. Here is the 2013 to 17 chart. Here's the 2017 to present time, folks. This is why I'm here. And he's got the six year trend line right there. So one says six and a half, one says six. I don't know anything about charting, but these guys all seem to be kind of agreeing on this. Then this can't be bad for any of us. I'm not gonna play the video but Drake has posted a Michael Saylor Bitcoin video to his 146 million Instagram followers. That can only be good for the entire market because as we know, if it hits Bitcoin, it eventually hits altcoins. Fred Rispoli was on with Thinking Crypto to uh, give kind of a um, next steps in the Ripple versus SEC case. Let's hear what he's got to say. Um, let's talk about SEC versus Ripple. Uh, I believe there's a trial coming up in April. Is, is that correct? And what can we expect, uh, you know, as far as next steps? Incorrect. There's no trial. It's just briefing. Um, and, and so, but this is, this has taken on a little bit more of importance than a lot of people are giving it. And um, if you look at some of my X threads on it, I've kind of talked about it, but it was, I always thought that SEC was going to try and re-argue the case in this remedies briefing based on everything that's happened after the fact. And what I mean by that is ODL, new contracts, you know, all of that. 
And what the SEC, when we saw that discovery dispute that came out where they're like, give us your contracts, Ripple, and Ripple was like, no. I mean, Ripple was never going to win that. But mm. what they're going to try and do is say, everything that you're doing now and will do in the future is basically a securities transaction like Judge Torres said certain ones were, in which he called, quote, institutional sales. So SEC is still trying to go for the jugular as much as they can. And if Ripple was smart, and they are, so hopefully they did it well enough, they would have immediately changed all of their sales to institutions um, to be as best outside of what you know Judge Torres ruled or securities transactions. Yeah. And so we're gonna, Ripple is going to fight that out in the briefing um, over the next two months. The SEC's filing their damages motion end of uh, this month or towards the end of this month, Ripple's got a month to file their opposition and then another essential month for the SEC to do their reply. Judge Torres will sit on it for, you know, two to four months and she'll make a ruling. And, and that'll be really important because that is going to get into ODL, new contracts, how Ripple's doing business now. We'll get a real, we'll get a glimpse into how all that's going. I'm sure Ripple will file some things under seal. There'll be a little battle about that. but. This is very important because it's going to really affect how Ripple does their business going forward. Interesting stuff. Wait a minute. Lawsuit settled? Dr. Martin Hisbach, he's, the, he's over at uh, Uphold, head of research. He tweeted this out. We are finally seeing the fruits of increased development on XRP since the lawsuit was settled. And XRP ETP is around the corner too. There is life in the old girl. He, he specifically said uh, on XRP since lawsuit was settled. Now, I think that he's referring to, um, I think he's referring to, um, you know, the judge coming out with her ruling, which is now in the appeal stage. And so, um, or in the, maybe not the appeal, I don't remember which, which it is, but anyway, it's in the, the later stages where they're working on dam to determining damages and all the things Fred just said. Now, um, so I think that he didn't really mean settled, but that doesn't mean that it's not a good thumbnail, thumbnail for you to come in here and find out what we talked about. So, all right, check this out. Wheezy, remember when Joseph Lubin said that uh, their uh, token generation event, um, it was before regulators were paying attention as with many things Joe Lubin says, that too was a lie. I also worked at the SEC. I was there for about eight years in a, a couple of different capacities. And I, I think they, the SEC could do more. But I am, I was, when I was at the SEC, I was impressed um, about how pragmatic and how thoughtful they were about this space. Uh, I started working on blockchain issues. And it wasn't my, my day job when I was at the SEC. I was a sort of a traditional... 40 act lawyer but something came across my desk and so i started getting involved in blockchain in 2014 and around 2014 they formed the digital ledger technology working group i was one of the first uh, of the six members of the original group and, and at that time i was just kind of blown away of how because it was so new back then but there was fraud and i was just blown away at how thoughtful and pragmatic and the steps they were taking even back then to get their head around this and they brought in people from the industry even back then to present to us and to talk to us and to let us interact. All right. Then we got this. This is the Ethereum doomsday scenario, folks. And what this is, because since since our CNBC here um, and the anchors on Squawk Box, since that's state-run media uh, and we they don't tell us the truth about much, and they certainly don't go into what ger their German counterpart is doing here. And, and reminder, this is... Um, Oliver Michel from Germany, um, he, um, he, he gets on their equivalent of, um, of CNBC there in Frankfurt, Germany. I think he does it every week. But here, he's going through the Ethereum doomsday scenario. It's, he said it would be an absolute disaster. And I'll, I want to reiterate here, we uncovered ETHgate. It was never about hurting Bitcoin or Ethereum. That was never what it was about. All we ever wanted was a level playing field. I do not think that 
Bitcoin, Ethereum, or any of them should be declared securities. I think that every, every, all of this innovation should, should be allowed to thrive in the United States at, within a level playing field where we find out what the best technology is. Let the money gut flow where the best technology is. That's what has been kept from happening. And so if the media lies and all of that, if the end destination is for them to be stuck in this doomsday scenario, I don't want it, but all these regulators, they, they, they ought to be held accountable for this because they created this situation. And the Ethereum founders helped. They should all be held accountable. That doesn't mean you have to hurt Ethereum, though. We have here mal aufgeschlüsselt, welche welche Möglichkeiten an Gary Gensler und die SEC jetzt haben. Wenn die SEC und Gary Gensler jetzt Variante 1, und wir fangen gleich mal mit der drastischsten an, dies zu einem Security erklären. Mhm. Wenn, wenn das der Fall wäre, Johanna, das, das wäre ein absoluter Gau für die komplette Szene. Was würde passieren? Ethereum müsste sofort von allen US-Börsen gedelistet werden. Das heißt, eine Coinbase, eine Kraken, wie die alle heißen, dürften ETH nicht mehr traden, weil ETH ja ein Security ist und diese Plattformen alle nicht zertifiziert sind, im Gegensatz zu Promethium. Oh, by the way, was, was? they also, uh, this guy is so smart. He also called Promethium a straw company, an SEC straw man company. Like, like it's literally just created as like a straw man company to be held up to achieve whatever twisted ends that Gary Gensler has in mind. SEC straw company. Okay, I don't know if he says it in this clip, but he said it in the bigger clip. And by the way, the bigger clip's right down here, folks. Was bedeutet, wenn ein Coin, der auf dem Weg nach oben ist, äh, plötzlich zu einem Security erklärt wird und von den Plattformen runtergenommen wird, das haben wir das erlebt äh, bei, bei XRP im Dezember 2020, das Ding ist einfach nur abgesagt. Das würde sich natürlich, weil es der zweitgrößte Coin ist, 18% Market Cap auf die komplette Szene auswirken und würde viele andere Coins die, und Token, die ähnlich strukturiert sind wie ETH, automatisch auch zu Securities machen. Die, die Futures auf wären alle illegal, mhm. wie eben beschrieben. Mhm. Natürlich bekäme die SEC Stress mit der CFTC. Es gäbe jetzt einen, einen Gerangel, wer hat denn jetzt die Kompetenz? Und die Chance auf den Spot-ETF, der im Moment ja auch den, den East nach oben beflügelt, der, der wäre, die Chance wäre gleich null. Und der Gary Gensler sagt immer, Staking ist wie Security. Mhm. Und Ethereum hat Proof of Stake. Das heißt, auch da würde er sofort alle Proof-of-Stake-Verfahren äh, in diese Security-Schiene pressen und damit wäre das alles e erstmal auf, auf Jahre hin zurückgebombt. Bombed back for years is basically if Ethereum is called a security. I agree with him. That's not what the industry needs. This is all because of all these agencies' lies. And it's not just the, C the SEC, it's the CFTC too. Now, Ron Hammond had put this tweet out. He's a lobbyist, used to work for Ripple. This, Russia and China creating a new blockchain payment system to rival Western ones, could be the national security risk that makes the US Congress move on stablecoin legislation, or at least brings folks to the table. And I said, hey, Ron, this isn't the first time the US government has been warned of the national security risk. Joseph Grunfest and U.S. intelligence warned Jay Clayton about the China threat. Why did Jay Clayton ignore both and sue Ripple as he walked out the door? This is what people should be asking. Remember this? Joseph Grunfest sent Jay Clayton a letter warning him um, not to sue Ripple. Then he also got this from the U.S. intelligence chief, John Ratcliffe. He, he wrote him a letter warning him that uh, of the China threat. Why did Jay ignore both and file a lawsuit against Ripple instead and walk out the door? That's the question. Well, we have other questions. Remember we, how we've been talking about COMEX 589 and the, the precious metals market manipulation? And remember how we've been talking about the Andy Schechtman video that was, um, that, that was censored even on the X platform across 
three or four different videos that was censored where you could not watch it. Remember that? Well, let me remind you, Christian Carlo, who was the CFTC chairman, is going to be at XRP Las Vegas. He's going to be on stage. There's going to be Andy Sheckman and, and Lynette Zhang, who are gold people. And this topic is going to be discussed. The 589, COMEX 589, the, the, the precious metals markets manipulation. What we're going to, um, and so I just wanted to remind you of that these XRP Las Vegas tickets are, from what I've heard, are going off the shelf right now. We're, we're uh, going into, what are we at? March 12th. Uh, my prediction was, is that in another 15 days or so, this thing sold out. It, with XRP sitting at 70 cents, going up 20 to 25 percent yesterday, um, I don't think this thing, I don't think these tickets last before a dollar. So, if you were thinking about going, and it's going to be that much more fun since the XRP price is moving. Now, let me remind you, Chris Giancarlo was CFTC chairman. You might remember this. He and he and uh, Jay Clayton were were both chairman of their respective agencies at the same time. This is in uh, six years ago. They sat in front of Congress and had a and talked about how they were working together and had a whole thing, um, had a whole whole thing in front of Congress about crypto. Okay, so against that backdrop, there's another guy that was at the CFTC. His name was Bart Chilton. In DAIXRP.com, we're gonna show you something about this precious metals market manipulation. There was a whistleblower, uh, and this isn't recent, but this is a while back, but th this guy gives you a great peek into how all of this manipulation worked, and it features uh, Bart Chilton. I'm the digital asset investor. I'm not an investment advisor. This is for entertainment purposes only. Please subscribe, hit the like button, tell your friends and family. I believe that precious metals being held down and manipulated is directly over the target for what is coming in our world. And that COMEX 589 rule is one of the tools in their toolbox, I guess, to address it one way or another. Question is, for who? <laughs> Here we go.